Hello and welcome to the fifth down huddle. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you want to see daily uh, NFL news updates and NFL highlights, NFL videos, NFL open questions, everything NFL, everything football, follow the Instagram page at fifth down huddle. If you're listening on Spotify, know that there is a YouTube page, same at fifth down huddle. Um, and we post daily videos, including fantasy advice uh, for daily news, quick takes, stuff that you can't really get on the podcast right away. Like, say, if on a Tuesday uh, the Patriots make a big move in the offseason or they make a big trade, uh, I'll make a take that day, and then I'll cover it more in the podcast that weekend, just so that you guys don't have to wait four days to hear what I think about said topic. So let's huddle right up. I wanted to let all of you know that I'm recording this on Thursday, July 30th, despite posting it on the 1st, and my reason for that is that I am headed out of town for a week and and a half to go to the Great Outer Banks. I'll be recording next week's episode while I'm there, but for now, I apologize if I miss any major stories within this next day and a half, and if there are any major stories, I'll be sure to get a quick take on them on the YouTube channel at 5th Down Huddle. So again, thank you so much for subscribing, for following Spotify, and following the Instagram page. So let's get into football. I'm answering a relatively controversial question today, that being the debate between putting Julian Edelman in the Hall of Fame and keeping him out. Those who argue for the Hall of Fame often point to his consistency, his clutch ability, Super Bowl MVP, and as well as the catch of Super Bowl 51. And another reason that they point to is the fact that Julian Edelman is arguably one of the most known receivers in the league. And that isn't necessarily a direct result of pure skill and ability. There's a big difference there between popularity and skill. Odell Beckham, arguably the most popular receiver in the NFL in terms of if you asked anyone on on the street who's Odell Beckham, more often than not, they're going to say, oh yeah, he's an NFL wide receiver. or He had that insane catch... uh, on the Giants. Um, so there's a big difference there. I'm not saying that Julian Edelman has an insane amount of skill um, or athletic ability, but what I am saying is that he is one of the most known receivers in the league, and that is because of his spotlight he has been given uh, with his great plays and performances in the Super Bowls that he has been in. Um, his name being well known has more to do with his memorial Super Bowl and playoff performances that have allowed fans to remember the name. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, people tend to argue that the former Super Bowl MVP is not crucial to the NFL's story, and the, quote, NFL story can be easily told without him. Those fans often argue that the Hall of Fame should be preserved for players that are a crucial piece of the NFL story, players such as Tom Brady, Peyton Manning, Julio Jones, Terrell Davis, just to name a few, it's extremely difficult to tell the story of the NFL without mentioning those names, as they each have played a crucial part in how the game is played today. I mean, the same problem comes, say, when you talk about a player like Frank Gore, who has also been in the same controversial debate in recent years. Arguably the most consistent running back in recent history in terms of production and longevity, yet, can you tell the NFL story without him? Could you explain to someone in a several hour long conversation the entirety of what the NFL is all about, how the game has evolved throughout its history, without mentioning Frank Gore? It's an interesting conversation. So to try and pin this down to pure facts, rather than this theoretical argument of the NFL story, let's compare Julian Edelman to other Hall of Fame slot receivers, or just receivers in general. Let's compare Edelman to Tim Brown, a receiver who has been the definition of consistent, with 9 straight 1,000-yard seasons and 10 straight 75-catch seasons. Those who argue for Edelman to be inducted into the Hall of Fame look towards his consistency, so let's pair consistent. compare consistency. The funny thing is that Julian Edelman has been insanely inconsistently consistent, and you'll understand why in a moment. If you look at his yard, touchdown, and catch totals, he seems hilariously inconsistent. Just looking at this, in, and I'm going to start kind of where his career kicked off in 2013, because before that, 
Uh, he was a really unknown receiver on the team. But in 2013, uh, he gets 105 catches, over 1,000 yards, and six touchdowns. The following year, in 2014, 92 catches, under 1,000 yards, and only four touchdowns. In 2015, barely under 700 yards, 61 catches, and seven touchdowns. In 2016, 98 receptions, 1,100 yards, and three touchdowns. In 2018, 74 catches, 850 yards, six touchdowns. And in 2019, 100 catches, 1,100 yards, and six touchdowns. So from an outside perspective, that's a really up and down. I mean, he starts at 1,000, drops all the way down to 700 at one point, back up to 1,100, down to 800 the following year, and then back up to 1,100. So very inconsistent, right? Well, this can kind of be immediately debunked by the fact that Edelman has struggled with an injury in a number of his recent seasons. Um, in 2018, he suffered an injury. Or no, he, my bad. In 2018, he didn't suffer an injury. He was actually suspended for four games. Although in 2015, he suffered an injury. And in 2014, he suffered an injury. So... There have been a few years here where it's, I mean, you look at the 2018 season, those four suspended games could have easily gotten him to 1,000 yards. I mean, he was only 150 under. Uh, you look at 2015, he missed seven games, no seven games. I think he could have gotten a, another 310 yards in seven games. It's not impossible to do for a guy like him. 2014, he was only 30 yards under 1,000, and he didn't play in two of the games. I think he could have done that. Um, so then we have to look at the game-by-game -game averages, the catch-by-catch -catch averages, just the averages overall in order to really gauge how consistent Edelman is when he's actually on the field. Because once you look there, he seems insanely consistent, contrary to what we saw before. Again, I'm going to start where his career kind of kicked off. 2013, I'm going to go from 2013 to 2019 here, just straight all the way down. 10.1 yards per reception in 2013. Then the next year, 10.6. The next year, 11.3. Then 11.3. Then 11.5. Then 11.2. So only a range of 10.1 to 11.5 within the last seven years of his career. That is insanely consistent in terms of yards per reception. Then you go to receptions per game, and it gets even crazier. 6.6, 6.6, 6.8, 6.1, 6.2, 6.3. Again, insanely consistent. Only a couple tenths of a difference there. You go to yards per game. 66, 69, 76, 69, 70, 69. Catch percentage. 69, 68, 69, 61, 68, 65. Yards per target. 7, 7.3, 7.9, 7.0, 7.9, 7.3. So based on those averages, Edelman has not insanely um, fallen off at any point in his career since it really kicked off, and he hasn't at any point really just boom and lifted off at any point in his career. He's been very, very consistent in terms of those averages. So when he's on the field for all 16 games, you can pretty easily gauge what kind of season he's going to have. So... Clearly, if the Hall of Fame was based solely on consistency, Edelman would be a solid candidate. Yet the problem is that the Hall of Fame is not simply based on stats or even production. Like I said before, it can also be based on how they have impacted the game. So, how has Edelman impacted the game? Maybe his stellar performance in Super Bowl 51 with five catches for 87 yards along with the impossible catch that gave New England a first down mid-comeback. Maybe his Super Bowl MVP performance in Super Bowl 53. Maybe his touchdown catch in Super Bowl 49. Maybe his clutch consistency during late game winning drives, something Brady has always been up to and used Edelman for. But back to the initial question. Is Edelman a Hall of Fame candidate? One last point I'd like to make before I give you my final answer is that there is a reason this is a heavily debated question. There is a reason no one can settle on yes or no without a steep argument. I'd even say that the fact people are arguing about it just goes to show why he shouldn't be let in. Someone who's going into the Hall of Fame, it should be a given. 
It should be a given that they belong there, that they are at such an elite high level that they need to move beyond just their name being said in future statistic reads. They need to be somewhere where they will never, ever be forgotten. The Hall of Fame. And it has to be a given. Because if it's not a given, if you're going to start letting players in where an argument can be made for them not to get in, then it doesn't become as exclusive. It doesn't become such a golden palace of fame and remembrance. I mean, it, it, it loses some of its value if you let in players that aren't a given. I personally don't think a player should be allowed in the Hall of Fame if it's not a given. If there's still argument about it, then they haven't done enough to get in. So in the end, I'd have to say no. Not yet. Because his career is not over, just as his resume remains unfinished. Maybe if Edelman continues to play for multiple years, puts up a couple thousand yard seasons and clutch performances, maybe I could say yes for sure. But as long as it remains a clouded and unsure argument, Julian Edelman should not be inducted at all. Hall of Fame players should rarely need debate as to whether or not they should be allowed in. So my next topic today is staying within the realm of recent geography, as I will now try my absolute best to maneuver my way through the minefield that is the question, is Tom Brady the greatest athlete alive? Yep, I'm getting into that one. I think it's a complicated question for a variety of reasons. What do we define as an athlete? Or better yet, what do we define as the ultimate athlete? According to the internet, an athlete is a person who competes in one or more sports that involve physical strength, speed, or endurance. The use of the term in sports such as golf or auto racing is somewhat controversial. Why are these controversial? They require an insane amount of skill. I mean, try racing a Formula One car at insane speeds down tight turns without spinning out. Try hitting a perfect putt on a championship green from 15 yards away. Why are they so controversial? Why? It's because of the physicality of the sport rather than simply the skill set. If, if we base athleticism on simply an advanced skill set, then working an oil rig could qualify someone as a world-class athlete. Building a complex computer system could qualify them as the same thing. That's why the term athlete, or the theoretical ultimate athlete, needs to be defined more by the physical ability of a person, not just how well they excel in any given sport or activity. So when we look to Tom Brady, is he the greatest athlete? We've laid out the definition of what the ultimate athlete would look like, what it really means to be the ultimate athlete, Someone with great speed, great strength, great endurance and toughness, great flexibility and durability, great mental toughness, and a variety of other things. So looking at his draft measurables would tell you that Tom Brady is barely a desirable athlete compared to other NFL players. I mean, just look at it. From, for, for the 40-yard dash, Brady ran a 5-2-8 second 40-yard dash. The second slowest time among quarterbacks at the 2000 NFL Combine. Only Louisville's Chris Redman with a 5-3-7 was slower. And if you look at his scouting report, it only gets worse. Poor build, skinny, lacks great physical stature and strength, lacks mobility and ability to avoid the rush, lacks a really strong arm, can't drive the ball downfield, does not throw a really tight spiral, system type player who can get exposed if forced to ad lib and gets knocked down easily. Then again, there is that opposing side of this argument that stands its own ground in terms of credibility. Tom Brady is turning 43 in a matter of days and is still doing what he does best. I mean, he just went 12-4 and four and was one game against the Dolphins away from having a first-round bye. Arguably, one bad ref call away from having a first-round bye, but I won't get into that argument. I hate it when people try to justify... Uh, losses with the referees. It's like, well, if it was that close in the first place, you can't be mad when a referee... We know referee mistakes happen. Blatant or not, we know they happen. They're humans. It happens. They make dumb decisions, and the rules keep them from being able to turn it around. It sucks. But you can't blame that on your team losing. It's, it's like the Saints. I believe it was the Saints against the Rams. Terrible pass interference call missed against the uh, Rams. 
uh, in favor of the Saints. And hell, everyone went crazy. People lost their minds. Um, it, it, to the point where it caused a rule change. And I'm just sitting there like, really? Like, guys, that isn't why you lost the game. <laughs> Drew Brees had another chance. He got the ball in overtime. Why didn't you win the game there? Well, Drew Brees threw an interception. Interesting. Granted, they would have been in field goal range, or granted, they would have been able to score a touchdown probably if that was called. But in the end, if a game is that close to the point where a bad call by a referee can decide it, then you just can't be mad. In the end, you shouldn't be that close with the other team anyways. You should win the game by a larger margin. That's what you're trying to do. Now, I'm not discrediting people who are mad about it. I'm not saying you can't be mad about it. But don't sit there and try to say that uh, these theoreticals of, oh, well, you know, they were a bad referee call away from winning the Super Bowl. Well, they weren't. There's a reason they lost to the Titans in the wild card round. And there's a reason Drew Brees threw an interception in overtime. Those things were either going to happen that week or they were going to happen the next. Either way, it proved that they were teams that were not ready to win a Super Bowl. And the reason for that is because they didn't get it done when they had the shot. They didn't get it done when they had a chance to. That's their fault, no one else's. Um, so, back to the point. A 43-year-old quarterback still playing at an elite level. Who would have thunk it? So, in that aspect, Brady could very well be the greatest athlete of all time, right? But if we base it simply off of durability with age, Jerry Rice might have a say in who comes out on top. So once again, Brady is denied the title of greatest athlete. Now before I declare this to be a fact, I want to be clear with Patriots and Buccaneers Nation, Tom Brady is the greatest quarterback of all time, no doubt. He's my favorite player in history of any sport. He is the ultimate underdog, and he is truly the... There is he truly the greatest athlete of all time, even in his prime. Not by a long shot. Despite his greatness, despite his undeniable greatness, he has never and will never be the greatest athlete of all time. When you bring it down to the measurables, the argument simply crumbles. You can take nearly any starting wide receiver or defensive end or corner or safety or running back or lineman, and you will find that they simply have better athletic measurables than Tom Brady has. There is no argument for it, and there never has been. In the end, though, Brady can be defined as the greatest player, the greatest competitor, the greatest teammate in history. Why? Because those don't base themselves simply on the measurables. Those base themselves on the intangible aspects of a player that make them great. I'd argue that Brady wins each and every one of those competitions, but in the end, the one title Brady will never come close to winning is the title of greatest athlete of all time. Again, Brady is an insanely great player. He's a winner. He wins games, and he's the greatest competitor. No matter who he's up against, no matter how tall the task, David and Goliath, whatever you want to compare it to, he will do absolutely everything he can to win, and more often than not, he comes out on top. And he's the greatest teammate in history. There have been so many teams that he has been given, so many receivers he's been given to work with, that simply do not have the athletic measurables. But Brady is such a great leader, and leadership is one of the greatest attributes a teammate can have. Brilliant leadership, and Brady has that. We see that. Brady is an, a brilliant leader, and he uses that to his advantage beautifully. He uses that to the team's advantage beautifully. It's great to watch and it's great to see because Tom Brady is the greatest teammate of all time. He is the greatest competitor of all time, the greatest player, and the greatest quarterback of all time. But again, in the end, when it's all said and done, when you look to the measurables, when you compare him to any other athlete in, mo in the majority of other sports, in the majority of other positions, maybe excluding kicker, punter, and long snapper, you are not looking at the greatest athlete of all time. It's so one title Brady's never going to have. Now, next year, I'm going to go through the top 20 
of the NFL 100 list. If I had the time, I'd go through all 100. Um, I haven't seen the list yet. I saw who won number one. I know that much. That was pretty obvious. It was all over Instagram. But outside of that, I do not know um, what the list looks like. So this is going to be my initial reaction here. Um, so at 20, they have Deshaun Watson, a tech, the Texans quarterback. That seems like a pretty pretty good place to put him. I mean, he, he didn't have an MVP level year last year. He obviously wasn't the best quarterback in the league last year, but he was really high up there. He's a great athletic player. Uh, he makes great plays moving within the pocket and outside the pocket. He has a heck of an arm. Um, he's a great athlete overall. I think 20 is a pretty good spot. 19, you got Khalil Mack, the Bears linebacker. Um, ah, I feel like Khalil Mack should be a little bit higher. Uh, yeah, I might, might end up disagreeing with that. It just depends on if there's any other linebackers above him. Uh, you got Travis Kelsey, the Chiefs tight end. 18 seems like a good spot. Um, again, I got to think about this, not just positional wise, but also in terms of comparing them to every other player in the NFL. I think 18 is a good spot for Travis Kelsey. He's a playmaker. Uh, if the Chiefs didn't have Travis Kelsey, they'd be a much less dynamic offense. Um, he, he, like I said, he's a playmaker. He is a literal, uh, massive force on that offense. Uh, Nick Bosa at 17. Uh, that's really good for him, Nick Bosa, but a defensive end. He was all over the place last year, um, not in terms of stats, but literally on the field all over the place. A strong defensive end. Um, it really just bolstered that 49ers D-line, which is already insanely strong. Uh, at 16, you got Aaron Rodgers, which is great for Aaron Rodgers considering the uh, offense he had. He didn't have much outside of Devontae Adams. Uh Granted, he had Aaron Jones at running back, so the run game was pretty strong this year. But outside of that and uh, Devontae Adams, he didn't have a whole ton to work with. Um, not the greatest receiving core in the league by far. So Aaron Rodgers, a solid season by him. He's pretty much one of those players you expect to be pretty far up there on the list every year. Um, at 15, you got Chandler Jones, the Cardinals linebacker. I can't say too much about that. I didn't watch too many Cardinals games this year. Uh, you, you, can, you can wonder why. Um, but Chandler Jones, I know he's a great linebacker. I know he's one of the best, but I might have put Khalil Mack above that. I'd have to look more into the stats uh, and compare those between Chandler Jones and Khalil Mack, but I just have a feeling that Khalil, Khalil Mack should take Chandler Jones' place, and Chandler Jones should be moved down to 19. Um, at 14, ooh, Tom Brady. At 14, I think it was 6th last year. If I'm not mistaken, I believe he was 6th last year. Tom Brady at 14. Dang. And that's controversial, and maybe not for the reason you think. Maybe not because I think he is higher than that, but you could argue he's a little lower than that. Um, you could argue both ways. If you're looking at it just by looking at a paper full of stats, I don't think he's that. he should belong that high. Um... But if you're looking at it in terms of who did the best with what they had last year, Tom Brady, uh, right around there, honestly. Maybe a tiny bit higher, but uh, analyze it for a few seconds here. That's not a terrible rating. It's a pretty good way to not piss a lot of people off and still piss a lot of people off. <laughs> they, they did the best they could there, and uh, I'm not too disappointed with that. You'd argue he could be lower, but uh, not insanely disappointed. You got Bobby Wagner at 13. That's it. He should always be top 15, Bobby Wagner. There he's a great linebacker. Never fails to impress. Uh, at 12, you got Drew Brees, the Saints quarterback. Drew Brees is a stud. He always has been. Um, I think it's fair to put him above Tom Brady this season. Uh, he just performed better than Tom Brady did. Granted, he did have a better uh, offensive team, but in the end, you can't really base it off that because that's just based on theoreticals. We don't know how great Tom Brady would have been this year if he had the offense he's going to have next year. So we have to base this, we have to base it off of what he had and what he did, and based off of that, Drew Brees is higher. At 11, you got Julio Jones. Um, I think he should be a bit higher. You figure Julio Jones is a top 10 guy, right? 
Hope they didn't put any wide receivers before him. Uh, at 10, you got Derrick Henry, the Titans running back. An absolute beast. I agree with that. At 9, Stephon Gilmore. Um, I wonder what defense. There's got to be at least one more defensive player ahead of him, right? I wonder who is. Probably Aaron Donald. Uh, at 8, you got DeAndre Hopkins. Um, yeah, he's a great receiver. Um, but it, I'd, I'd still say Julio Jones is better. Julio Jones is really just unguardable in man-to-man, and I think there's a few players who could do it against DeAndre, Stephon Gilmore, I think could at least tone him down. Uh, but I don't know if Stephon Gilmore could really tone down Julio. At 7, we've got George Kittle, 49ers tight end. I think that's a great spot. George Kittle is a real playmaker, easily the best receiver on that team. That's a great spot to put him. At 6, you got Christian McCaffrey, an absolute playmaker. Um... Damn, I know they definitely put Michael Thomas above Christian McCaffrey, and I don't think that's that's a good choice. Yep, in fact, Michael Thomas, the next one up. Saints wide receiver Michael Thomas uh, above Christian McCaffrey? No, no, I wouldn't even put him above Julio. Uh, yeah, he had a lot of catches, but I don't think that uh, I don't think he's he should be that high on top 100 players in the NFL, which basically means top 100 and football players in the world I don't know if Michael Thomas is a top five guy Patrick Mahomes at four um interesting number three got Aaron Donald that's fair number two Russell Wilson and number one Lamar Jackson the most controversial part of this list up to this point in terms of social media has been those top three quarterbacks of course Patrick Mahomes Russell Wilson and Lamar Jackson Ah, uh, man, I I'd have to say that if I if I were in charge of this list, I'd go Mahomes, Jackson, and Wilson. Here's why: Mahomes should be at number one, um, just out of the fact that if he wasn't injured for those couple of games, I definitely think he would have won MVP again. Um, and I I don't think Russell Wilson again. This isn't top 100 players. Um, in terms of overall ability, this is this is based on, uh, or it should be. I don't know if it completely is, but it should be based on how they played last year. So the because it's called top 100 players of 2019, not top 100 players of the last decade um, or the last three years. It's 2019. So I think in 2019, Patrick Mahomes played better than Russell Wilson and Lamar Jackson. Lamar Jackson, an absolute beast. On the ground, uh, above average in the air, but a beast on the ground. Patrick Mahomes, an absolute monster through the air, and above average on the ground. So, uh, in the end, I'd have to put Patrick Mahomes at number one, Lamar Jackson at two, Aaron Donald maybe at three, maybe at four. Aaron Donald and Russell Wilson pretty much tied for third. Um, I would put Julio Jones at five, Christian McCaffrey at six, Keep George Kittle at seven. Um, D yeah, I'd keep D Hop at eight. Uh, or I may, I think I'd put Stefan Gilmore at eight, then followed by D Hop, and then uh, Michael Thomas at ten, Derrick Henry at eleven, Drew Brees at thirteen, Bobby Wagner fourteen, Tom Brady fifteen. Tom Brady maybe. Uh, I don't know. Is Tom Brady a better player in the NFL than Nick Bosa? I think he is. Is he a better player in traffic? Yeah, he is. He is. He's better than Aaron Rodgers last year. Uh, so, yeah. Outside of those, uh, kind of that top 10, everything else seems pretty solid. Uh, in terms of the top 20, I haven't, I haven't looked past or before that. Uh, it's interesting that Tyree Kill wasn't on that top 20. Can you think of any other players that I feel like should have been in the top 20? Um, Shaquille Barrett, I mean, he led the league in sacks. I figure he might be in the top 20. Um, damn, who else could be in there? J.J. Watt usually is. Um, can't really think of any other players right now who I feel like should be in here that aren't. Uh, yeah, that, that seems pretty solid. Pretty solid top 20, but the top 10 definitely needs some work done. Um, 
So yeah, thank you so much for tuning into this podcast as we come up on the 30-minute mark here. can't believe I've been sitting here talking for 30 minutes. feels like 15. But anyways, thank you so much for tuning in. Again, please follow the Instagram page if you want daily NFL updates, highlights, and pretty much open forum questions, uh, kind of like who's going to have the better season, who's going to play better, who's going to be better, uh, who should this team sign, who should this team get rid of, You know, just questions like that. Uh, fantasy tips, short videos uh, where I talk about fantasy. So yeah, um, check in with that. Give it a follow if that's what you want to see, if that's what you want to hear. Uh, follow the Spotify page if you want to listen to the next week's episode. And subscribe to the YouTube channel so you can see extra special content, including fantasy and quick takes on recent news. Again, thank you so much for tuning in, and I'll see you next week. Thank you for huddling up with me.